This video lecture is entitled Ethical Systems, Consequences versus Principles. This video lecture is for the course Christian Worldview and Biblical Decision Making at the East Asia School of Theology. In history, two of the most important ethical models for decision making are the consequentialist ethics and principled ethics. In this lesson, we are going to look at these two approaches to ethics and we will critique them or evaluate them. That is to say, we will um, not only examine what these two approaches are, but we will also see, talk about what their positives and negatives are. Now, in this lesson, I am going to use several examples from the Nazi era to illustrate some of my points. This is not to say that the Nazis were the only ones who committed terrible acts in history, but their, um, their actions do provide us with some vivid examples of that illustrate why moral choices always have consequences. So let's begin by looking at consequentialist ethics. The overarching principle for consequentialist ethics is begin with the end in mind. In his book, The Seven Habits, Habits of Highly Effective People, one of the habits that author Stephen Covey urges his readers to adopt is begin with the end in mind. By this, he means that his readers should decide where they want to be and then work toward achieving their goals. He goes on to encourage his readers to imagine that they are attending their own funerals and to ask themselves, what do you want other people to say about you at your funeral? This is a very powerful illustration because most of us do want our lives to count for something. We don't want our lives to be a complete waste. Now, one kind of consequentialist ethics is known as ethical egoism. And ethical egoism says, do what is best for yourself. Three people who are associated with this ethical approach are Epicurus, Adam Smith, and Thomas Hobbes. Ethical egoism says that all moral decisions are made for the best interest of the individual. That is, we decide something is right or wrong because it benefits us personally in some way. So what possible biblical support is there for, biblical, for ethical egoism? Well, Deuteronomy chapters 27 through 30 provide us with some possible biblical support for ethical egoism. Because in these four chapters, um, the people of Israel gathered on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal near Shechem in, in Israel, the promised land. And at that time, People on one side of the mount, one mountain side would recite all the blessings that would come to the Israelites if they obeyed God's commands. But then all the people on the mountain, on the side of the other mountain, then recited all the curses that would come to the Israelites if they disobeyed God's commands. And so um, these curses and blessings can be seen as God's appeal to his people for self-benefit 
through obedience, that is doing what is right to for obedience to his command, that is doing what is right. In the New Testament, receiving Christ in order to be forgiven and obtain eternal life can also be seen in this life. So we see that this ethical theory does have a place in our lives as Christians, but we still need to question the full adequacy of this system. And that leads us to an evaluation of ethical egoism. Um, so the first thing I want to point out as we evaluate ethical egoism is the problem of altruistic acts and the biblical call to selfless love. This system, that is ethical egoism, fails to give an adequate explanation for altruistic acts. These are acts that have no apparent benefit for the one performing the act, but it still seems like the right thing to do. For example, on 9-11, many firefighters went into the burning buildings of the World Trade Center to rescue total strangers, knowing that they, that they themselves would very likely forfeit their own lives for these strangers. So what kind of benefit did these firefighters reap? An adequate system must, must also account for our duty to do what is right out of an interest in the welfare of others as well. Okay. A second issue that we need to consider when evaluating ethical egoism are, is the issue of conflicts of interest. Another problem for the ethical egoist is any conflict of interest. If it is in my best interest to kill someone, how is it that we can judge the best interest of the individual who is about to be exterminated? Thus, we see that moral choices frequently involve a conflict of interest. This requires an appeal to some external system in order for the conflict to be resolved. If I am an anti-Semite, how is it that it is in my best interest to exterminate all Jews, but it is in their best interest to survive? So we see that we have a conflict of interest here. A third issue we need to look at is the issue, the question of potential justification and encouragement of selfishness. It would seem that moral anarchy would be the only real result of ethical egoism because survival of the fittest and the law of the jungle would be my only guiding principles in this system. So the so survival of the fittest and the law of the jungle says that I should look out for number one, my so only after my own interest and not anybody else's interest. And this kind of thinking, the survival of the fittest, can, could justify some pretty atrocious action on my part. So here we have a tiger eating, um, attacking and killing another animal. Why? Because the tiger needs to live. But if we apply this, own kind, this same kind of reasoning to our own actions, then that can lead us to justify some pretty awful things. A fourth issue we need to examine is that in ethical egoism, we have a failure, we often have a failure to appreciate the important cooperative and interdependent aspects of life. 
Ethical egoism failed because it seemed to assume that altruism is somehow a negative sum game, whereas true altruism benefits both the self and others, not by creating dependency, but by creating healthy interdependence, a network of mutually beneficial relationships which are not characterized by patronage and subjugation alongside continuous neediness and dependence. So, as we see here, it would seem that this perspective is inadequate and dangerous, especially if this is the only ethical approach we choose to use. So, as we saw with Deuteronomy 27 through 30, there is a place for ethical egoism. But if this is the only approach we take to um, making ethical decisions, then we have some serious problems. So let's look at a second form of consequentialist ethics, and that is utilitarianism. Um, the greatest utilitarianism tries to accomplish the greatest good for the greatest number. And this ethical approach was developed and advocated by Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mills, and Joseph Fletcher. This is also sometimes called consequentialism. This theory, utilitarianism, advocates the greatest good for the greatest number of people as determined by the end result. Thus, if by some or any means I can obtain the desired good result, that makes the action morally acceptable. So let me give you some examples of utilitarian ethics and see if you agree with this or not. So the first example is of a politician who might lie to become president of his or her country so that he or she can then use his or her power to help make the world become a better place. Okay, so that's the first example I have for you. The second example of utilitarian ethics would be a retired couple who lives together but never gets married so that they will continue to get the pension benefits of one person's deceased spouse. That is another example of utilitarian ethics. A third example of utilitarian ethics would be of doctors who are willing to lie to help very poor patients receive health service payments. So, you know, it, it, it would be good for these poor patients to receive health service payments so that they can afford the medical care that they need. So does that make it right for doctors to lie on their behalf? After all, these patients are poor and they need good medical care, but they don't have the money. And so as we look at these three examples, we see why we have the phrase, the ends justify the means. So after looking at these examples, we might be asking ourselves, is there any possible supporting biblical passage for utilitarianism? And believe it or not, there is. And that verse, that passage is Hebrews 12, 2, which says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. And so here we see that Jesus went to the cross 
which was clearly a bad thing, in order to achieve the ultimate good of redemption from sin for all humankind. Now, there are two main types of utilitarianism. First is act utilitarianism. The question to answer here is, what overall ultimate impact will this act have on our desire to see good triumph over evil? Then there is rule utilitarianism. The idea here is that certain rules tend to bring about greater good for greater numbers of people. These rules are not justified on the basis that they are inherently right per se, but because they tend to produce more frequently desirable outcomes for greater numbers of people. So let's evaluate utilitarianism. The first point we need to evaluate is the importance of seeking to evaluate the potential results and impacts of ethical decisions. So it is important for us to evaluate the potential results or impact of our ethical decision. So this is one way that utilitarianism can be helpful because it does force us to evaluate what kind of impact our ethical decisions will have. Thus, this serves as part of the moral decision-making process, but as we will see, it is also a very dangerous and incomplete system of ethical evaluation and decision-making. So the second point I want to make in our evaluation of utilitarianism is the problem of human finiteness and complexity in ethical evaluations. In other words, how is the ultimate consequential value determined? How can we adequately know the outcome of all ethical, of all given actions. How is the ultimate consequential value determined? How can we adequately know the outcome of all given actions? How do we know what is good and what is bad and for whom? The strong and for how long? One day, one year, two minutes? It would seem that omniscience here would be one of the capacities necessary to bring about truly just decisions every single time. But that is precisely what we lack as human beings. So in other words, it may feel as if we're playing checkers because we we have a finite understanding of what's happening. But at the same time, God is playing 12-dimensional chess because God knows everything. So this is a serious problem with utilitarian ethics. Another problem with utilitarian ethics is the problem of competing ethical values and the need for independent principles for making moral judgments. What if some greater good action violated some higher value? For example, one way to eliminate overpopulation is, is to exterminate all the poor 
and infirm. But this sounds a lot like Nazi Germany. For example, we have the um, case of Dr. Hans Os Osberger, who initially identified the symptoms of Asperger's. And yet he was responsible for euthanizing disabled children while working at a Vienna clinic during the Nazi regime. So this, so in this case, Dr. Asperger was trying to achieve a greater good, that is ridding the population of infirm people and disabled people. So how did he do that? He euthanized them. That is an example of utilitarian ethics. Another way of achieving a higher good would be to enforce a one or two child policy like they used to have in China. Here, one is either forcibly sterilized after their first, after a mother has their first or second child, or one is required to abort any subsequent babies, unless, of course, it's a girl. But don't these measures violate other rights and values, like the life of the baby, for example, that take precedence? It would seem so, although these tactics can and have been justified by utilitarian ethical schemes. Values desperately need some sort of independent confirmation and evaluation to be determined to be worthy of elevation over other values. A fourth problem with, with utilitarianism is the tendency to let the end justify the means. As was already hinted at above, all kinds of morally atrocious acts can be committed in the name of some higher good, some greater end. Nazi Germany, for example, performed lots of medical experiments on humans that led to several advances in science. But, Few would consider these moral experiments just because they brought about beneficial results for other humans. For example, we have here on this slide um, a picture of a medical experiment on a gypsy prisoner who was made to drink seawater. Now, this caused him terrible suffering, but Nazi scientists argued that this experiment produced knowledge that was beneficial for many other people. Good ethics pay attention to both the outcome and the means for getting there. And a fifth issue that is raised by utilitarian ethics is the failure to recognize that some actions are inherently good regardless of the outcome they produce. And the flip side of that is also true. The failure to recognize that some actions are inherently wrong regardless of the outcomes they produce. Sometimes it's sometimes doing the right thing. Um, for example, reporting a defective product to your company's quality control department, even when your supervisor tells you to look the other way, because fixing the defect will cost the money, the company a lot of money. Sometimes 
doing the right thing actually causes more trouble and more harm, at least for a time anyway. And yet, it is still the right thing to do. And in the case of companies that have um, required their employees to overlook product defects, it has actually, history shows us that those companies have actually ended up paying far more in damages because then, then they did in save any, then they, um, they ended up paying far more money in damages than they would have had if they had just taken the time to correct those problems in the first place. Okay, so now we now that we've looked at consequentialist ethics, let's look at principle ethics. The overarching principle ethics is that there are inherent rights and wrongs. So there are two principal proponents of principle ethics, Socrates and Immanuel Kant. And principle ethics is also known as deontological ethics. So you may have heard it heard that term, deontological ethics, before. And so principal ethics and deontological ethics are both named for the same approach to ethics. Um, Dion is, is a Greek word which means duty or moral obligation. And so that's what principal ethics um, says. It says that there are certain uh, moral principles or moral actions that we have a duty to perform or to observe. So let's look at some possible biblical support for principal ethics. The first is comes from Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, which is um, a listing of the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments are a very clear example of principal ethics. Do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, and so forth. Then another example of principal ethics is Matthew chapters 5 through 7 which is also known as the Sermon on the Mount, because in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gave us many clear principles for moral behavior. So these are two very clear biblical examples of principal ethics. It is traditional to see Christian ethics as largely, if not completely, deontological in nature. We have already noted previously some of the scriptural passages that might support other foundations for ethics, but most Christians openly recognize the deontological character of the Christian faith and life. Of course, the primary, if not sole source of such principles is the word of God, the Bible and the moral standard that it reveals to us. So, when we are talking about principal ethics, this approach says that some actions are inherently right or wrong regardless of their context. The idea here is that certain ethical principles are inherently right or wrong, and so we must do the right and refrain from the wrong regardless of the outcome. There may or may not be a hierarchy of greater and lesser principles, sometimes deemed graded, graded absolutism. Depending on who is talking about, who is um, 
clarifying which type of theolog deontological theory, but these principles, although debated, still remain right or wrong as they stand. Another um, thing that principle ethics says is that we are obligated to do what is right and to refrain from what is wrong. Thus, morality is duty-based, and these duties are absolute or universal, grounded either in natural law or divine law, or perhaps something of both. For example, Immanuel Kant, through his categorical imperative, saw our duty as based in the principle of universalizability, universalizability, where any given principle should be such that all people everywhere and at all times should always do it, thus making it a universal law. So one example of an obligation of a moral obligation that we have is remaining faithful to our spouses. So for those of us who are married, we once we say I do, we then have a moral obligation to remain faithful to our spouse no matter what, until death do, does us part. And so that would be, uh, according to principal ethics, a moral obligation that each one of us who is married has. And it is an absolute obligation. So let's evaluate principal or deontological ethics. So um, there are some problems with deontological ethics. One of these is the problem of discerning the truly foundational principle or principles that we need to build our ethics upon. That is to say, what are the truly foundational principles that we should build our ethical system on. And related to that, how do we find and justify these principles? For example, for some such as Norman Geisler following Thomas Aquinas, there are several self-evident as well as biblically revealed moral obligations. Other, others claim that there is really only one principle that we should build our ethical foundation on, and that is agape, or radically self-disinterested, self-denying, and self-giving love. And one person who um, espouses the idea that all we need is agape for our ethical system is Paul Ramsey. Thus, it is not um, thus, principal ethics does not really tell us the content of our duty without necessarily having to appeal to some sort of external basis or bases. Certainly, for the Christian, we have many duty-based moral demands placed upon us by a holy and righteous God. But detaching this ethic from a theistic basis simply forces us back into finding a foundation for ethics within ourselves and within nature and nowhere else. We therefore wind up trapped in the dead-end relativism of trying to determine what our lives ought to be by looking at what and where they are and nothing more. History shows us how tragically tempting it is it has been in principal ethics to detach ethical norms, even those norms given to us in the pages of scripture, 
from a personal and theistic foundation. All of this discussion leads us to our next point of critique, namely what might be called the secularization and depersonalization of ethical principles. The tendency to secularize and depersonalize ethical principles is another problem with principle ethics. When the emphasis is on grounding ethical principles in some sort of abstract concept or set of concepts like reason rather than in personal relationships, there is a tendency to make these principles cold and sterile codifications of moral norms that have no grounding in real life. When they are secularized and detached from the God who embodies and demonstrates them so beautifully to us as his creatures, they become impersonal and devoid of significance and grace. For example, um, during the um, Enlightenment, Renaissance and Enlightenment eras, one slogan that came to be popular was the slogan, man as the measure of all things. And this slogan, man as the measure of all things, also came to be applied to ethics. In the end, the principles can themselves almost become idols that replace the need for wisdom and intimacy with God and other people. But there is a positive side to this, and that is that such principles can be the source of great good when they are coupled with divine wisdom and grace. And this is the next point of evaluation and observation here. And that is the need for God to relationally empower ethical principles. Because without God empowering and guiding us in the discernment and application of ethical norms, we can go badly astray from the reasons and context in which such norms were originally given and we can rarely rely on the principles themselves to make us good rather than submitting our lives to God as the only one who can make us truly righteous. So this is something we definitely need to consider when we uh, evaluate deontological ethics. Another problem with deontological ethics is the tendency toward legalism, closely related to the last point because the emphasis is placed on rules and regulations without paying much attention to the personal side of ethics. There is a tendency to become legalistic and devoted to rules rather than to be concerned about people. A fifth point that we need to consider when evaluating deontological ethics is the central role of character and virtue in the wise and good application of ethical norms. If all we have are principles to follow, it would seem that if we know the right thing to do, then we can and should do it. But everyone knows that ethical living is neither that easy nor that simple. We need more than principles to do what is right. We need both the Holy Spirit and the kind of moral fiber, character, that empowers us to discern the way that is right and to have the courage and strength to actually go that way. And so, in the next um, video lecture, we are going to look at character or virtue ethics. So I will be talking more about this. And then a sixth point 
that I want to make is that um, in deontological ethics, we have the problem of competing norms in the con in the context of complex ethical choices. Perhaps one of the biggest problems with principal ethics is that moral norms and principles are not always complementary. Sometimes there are two or more competing principles present in any given moral dilemma. For example, um, some people are tempted to lie to a loved one about their illness. Because on the one hand, they want to be kind to their loved ones. And so their thinking is, if I tell a loved one, my loved one, that their situation is really bad, then they might lose hope for living and die. So they are, so many people are tempted to lie to their loved one about their true medical condition. How then can we discern between these principles to determine which, if any, take precedent over the others? What independent set of criteria would give us the ability to decide between such moral principles? Apart from wise moral guidance, we are likely to run into all kinds of seemingly insoluble ethical conundrums. So at the end of the day, these moral theories are helpful as far as they go, but they remain incomplete and do not give us a comprehensive enough picture of how to gain moral discernment and how to live well in the world we live in. So in the next video lecture, I'm going to look at virtue or character ethics. So please go to the next video and we'll continue to look at some different ethical systems.